there is a single household appliance that has come about uh, as a result of the malevolent influences of the forces of darkness. It is the dishwasher. Just mentioning it, I started four fights in this room right now. Because you go one of two ways with a dishwasher. You either believe that it washes dishes or that it doesn't. And if you're like me and you believe it washes dishes, you just disc golf plates into the dishwasher from across the room, and you hit the play button, and they come out cleaner than they were before. Good enough. But if you're like my wife, you've taken a part-time course at a community college in hydraulics to better understand the way that the water hits the plates to get maximum cleanliness. But then you wash the dishes before you put them in the dishwasher anyways thus exercising futility. You know, we've all got quirks. We've all got these things that we do for reasons we can't really explain. And these things are the realm of what psychologists like to call personality. Brian Little, a psychological researcher, says that personality tries to make sense of how all of us are like all other people, how like some of us are like some other people, and we're like no other people. Let me say that again because I said it wrong. This tries to make sense of how all of us are like all other people, like some other people, and like no other people. So you walk into a room thinking that you're the only one that stays up late by candlelight, charting out exactly how you're going to fill the dishwasher, and then you meet somebody else and they say they do the exact same thing, right? There are commonalities through some of these traits that we share as well. Now, a sermon on personality is also probably a little bit of a divisive thing, right? You walk into a room full of Christians, and you're going to get some people who cross their arms, and like one of our staff members, because we did a personality assessment as a staff this week, you'll say, this is not much better than astrology, really. (laughs) Some of you, some of you walk into rooms wearing t-shirts with your Myers-Briggs type, And somewhere in the middle, I think, is the biblical truth about how we should actually approach this topic. For those of you that are a little too into it, there are going to be a couple cautions. But for those of you who are kind of wholly against it, I would turn your attention to someone who had something to say about thinking about ourselves long before Carl Jung or any of these other people did. You can read what he said in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 8. This is the Apostle Paul writing. And he says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others." We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So today we're going to look at how personality fits into our shape all the things that God has made us, and how we can use those things to determine where he is calling us to partner with him in the world. And what we're going to learn is that personality is just that default mode of operation for us, the default way of being in the world. After that, we're going to learn what personality isn't and the place it plays in our self-stewardship. And then I'm just really briefly going to take you through kind of one of the most prevalent models of personality. And after that, we're going to talk about how sometimes we're going to need to work with our personality and sometimes we're going to need to work against it. Now, when I was learning how to interpret the Bible and share it with people, my preaching teacher, Daryl Johnson, said, when you're in a passage that's particularly in the letters, you want to look for commands, imperatives, words that tell you to engage in an action. And if you were going to look for a repeated action word in Romans 12, the word that you would find in the Greek text is think. Think about what? About yourself. That might surprise some of us. You're being commanded by the Bible to think about yourself. One scholar, um, he paraphrases verse 3 of chapter 12 this way, don't think more highly of yourselves than is right for you to think, but think with sober and accurate thinking about who you are in Christ. Think about yourself. One scholar says Romans 12, 3 to 8 suggests that determining and then faithfully using one's spiritual gifts 
is the next most important task in the Christian's life after the fundamental cognitive and moral transformation that accompanies conversion. So you convert, you become a Christian, you start to get the God stuff sorted out, and once you're getting the God stuff sorted out, you need to get the you stuff sorted out. You need to think about yourself, and you need to do it soberly, Paul says, accurately, which insinuates that there's something at stake if you think about yourself wrongly. What does it look like? What does it look like when people think about themselves wrongly? It looks like that really rebellious kind of anarchist becoming church administrator and throwing all of the systems in disorder. It looks like that overly sensitive and anxious person becoming a senior leader without having dealt with those problems, and they nurse themselves to sleep with bottles and with pills. It looks like that person who gets into the Christian faith and thinks that they have to be super social and super out there, even though they're like a very, very introverted person. And eventually it gets them so irritable that they snap and they do irreparable harm to someone. There is something at stake, not just for you, but for the community and our witness in the world if we think about ourselves wrongly. If we put ourselves in the wrong place based on how God has made us. And we actually have a wonderful example in Scripture of the disciples making a decision as a community based on their shape. And you'll find it in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 1, we read, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, so this is just at the beginning of the early church, Jesus has ascended, the Hellenistic Jews, so Greek-speaking, Greek-leaning Jews, among them were complaining against the Hebraic Jews, so cultural problems because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12, Jesus' 12 early followers, gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So you have the early church in a bit of a pickle. Things administratively aren't working out, and it's causing conflict. The 12 disciples who are the leaders of the church at that day look at this problem, and they actually say, the Greek text says, where it says it would not be right for us, it's actually it would not be desirable, as in we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that table service stuff. Why not? Well, you look at the 12 disciples, and most of them seem to be gifted, spiritually gifted. We're talking about our shape here. They're spiritually gifted to teach. In fact, some of them have given the gift of tongues to speak miraculously in other languages so that people can hear them. Their heart desire, because of the call Jesus gave to them, is to see the gospel push out further and further from its center in Judea, to see it grow. And they have the ability to do that. They have the networks, they have the connections, and they're also the people who are eyewitnesses of Jesus, right? So they can do that in a way other people can't. But I think personality also has something to do with it, because if you've ever tried to type Peter, for example, one of the apostles, you'll notice that he is flighty, he's impulsive, he's spontaneous, he jumps headfirst into situations without thinking how it's going to turn out and has to back out later. An administrator, he is not. You don't want Peter working systems for you, right? That's probably actually why he doesn't become the main senior leader in Jerusalem of the church, right? James does that. Maybe personality had something to do with it. So maybe personality has something to do with us. Maybe we need to consider it. So what is personality? Most psychologists will tell you that personality is made up of individual traits. And one researcher, Daniel Nettles, an Oxford scholar, says that a trait is a stable individual, their traits are stable individual differences in the reactivity of mental mechanisms designed to respond to particular classes of situation, said exactly like an Oxford scholar would say it. (laughs) What he means there is that these are stable, predictable ways that your mind has been trained to do certain things. And if traits make up personality, I would say personality is our default mode of operation. It's the unique way we're conditioned to behave by our biology, our experience, and our environment. So why do we think about this stuff? Well, remember Dave last week talked about our abilities, and he used the parable of the talents. And in the parable of the talents, he said, each of the people in that parable are a servant. They're a servant to a king. 
And as a servant to a king or a servant to a master, they're given a large investment of money. And the expectation is that they will steward that money, that they will invest it so it can grow. Steward, okay? We have one really bad cultural example of stewardship, and that's Denethar of Gondor for you nerds out there. A steward is somebody who rules in place of someone else over something that they do not actually own. So you can see he doesn't get to sit on the throne. He's not the king. And stewardship has become this theological word that we use to describe the way that we care for creation, the way that we steward or care for our finances, because nothing we own is really ours. And I think, ultimately, we're called to be stewards of ourselves. Because as much as we are children of God, as much as we are chosen and not forsaken, we are also, each of us, an investment God has made in the world. He's invested in you. He has something for you to do in his kingdom. And learning your personality, as we're going to see, is going to help you to be a better steward of yourself. It's going to teach you those places where you're naturally strong and those places where you have to go against your personality to do what God is calling you to do. Before we go on, I also need to say what personality is not. So if personality is just this default mode of operation, what isn't it? Personality is not our identity. Jesus gives us that. Paul says in Ephesians, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. This like staple of evangelical theology is that we are not what we do, good or bad. Our identity, who we are, was won for us by Jesus on the cross. We're children of God. What we do, yes, is to be consistent with that, to be consistent with the grace that we've received, but what we do is not who we are. And we need to say that because some of you are going to be really excited after the sermon, and every room you go into, you're going to be like, I'm a type 2, I-N-T, L-M-N-O-P, and you know, this morning I took like a Facebook exam that said I'm a red velvet cupcake. And the flip side of that the thing that's implicitly often being said by people who do that is, this is who I am. You can't hold me responsible for the parts of my wiring that are coming out in this situation. And that's not true. Psychologists will tell you a lot of these personality things, like even the best one that we're going to examine today, it's only like 20 to 30% predictive of your actual behavior. A lot of your behavior is determined by your environment. You are perfectly capable of stepping outside of your natural tendencies and wirings. You do it all the time. So not only is personality being your identity not true theologically, it's not true psychologically either. Personality is also not our calling, but it can be part of it. So we've been talking about our shape, our spiritual gifts, our heart desires, our abilities, our personality, our experience. And we're saying that somewhere in the midst of all that and the way the Holy Spirit mystically speeches, speaks to each of us in our own hearts and through community, that's where we're called. Personality is going to show you your default mode of operation. It's going to show you where things are easy for you, where you're energized, where it's going to kind of just flow. But God is perfectly capable to call you at many times and in many places to do things that are going to be outside of that, as I've already been saying, right? So you can't just kind of do the millennial thing where it's like, I just need to figure out what I'm really good at and what I like to do. Oh, I'm like an artistic, sensitive, introverted type. So I can just like stay in my basement and paint paintings and never have to talk to anybody again. That's not true, okay? That's not the goal of this. Personality is not your calling. But it can help you understand where you're going to be most effective, And personality is also not our character. But it can help you determine how easy or hard certain characteristics are going to be. So sanctification is this fancy word for how the Holy Spirit looks at us like Michelangelo looked at a block of marble. And inside that block of marble, he sees Jesus, just like Michelangelo saw David. And he just chips away those things on us that are not Jesus. He's doing that all our lives, the Holy Spirit. Which means that, you know, if you're a naturally disagreeable, assertive, like, charge in and take charge, who cares what happens type of person, you're not off the hook when it comes to the spiritual gift of gentleness, when it comes to the spiritual characteristic of gentleness. We're all called to be gentle, regardless if it's easy for us or not. Now, 
if you're that highly disagreeable, assertive person, maybe don't put yourself in a ministry where gentleness is the thing that's always required of you, right? That's wisdom. That's where personality can help you out. With all that on board, now I'm just going to take a minute to explore kind of what's emerging as one of the most accredited theories of personality out there. It's the, the big five aspects. So the big five, we're going to get into this tonight if you want to come out tonight and get a little bit of a deeper understanding of this. Um, it's a, an approach to personality that has been shown to be predictively powerful. Essentially, they've done studies as long as like 54 years and determined that actually if someone's highly extroverted at the start of that study, by the end of that study, they tend to have advanced more in their career than people who aren't as extroverted. And we can see that consistently through a large group of people, which means that extroversion actually has predictive power in how you will behave and what the outcomes of your life will be. They're also starting to do brain scans, and they determine that, like, if somebody scores high, for example, in conscientiousness, as we'll see, right, they're very, like, duty-driven, they tend to have a more hyperactive and even sometimes an enlarged frontal lobe. Like, their brain is actually different than other people's brains, right? So this theory is more, it's better than astrology, okay? It, it's, it's, it's working its way into, like, hard science, right? Here's the big five characteristics. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Unlike other tests and assessments that we love, like the Myers-Briggs or the four temperaments or the four colors, you don't get to just like be something at the end of this test, right? You don't get like a fancy name to carry around. You just score on a percentage in each of these characteristics. We all have them, we just exhibit more or less of them. So a brief description of each. Openness to experience. Tony Stark, pretty good example of this. This is our tendency towards abstract thinking and the broadness of our mental associations. So if you're high in openness to experience, you really love variety, you love new experiences, um, you're probably very aesthetic, you love beauty, you seek all different types of art. Um, you tend to think in the abstract. You can sit and think about thinking and think about ideas for a very long time. On the flip side, you can often also be scattered and inconsistent and unfocused if you're high in this trait. Um, how this trait, what, what people are starting to think this trait is related to, um, they may be, may, maybe our gray matter, maybe the speed with which our synapses fire, they're not 100% sure physiologically, but they know it has to do with the broadness of our mental associations. So if I told you, hey, think about corn, some of you are only thinking about corn. Like literally, you can imagine a corn on the cob, that's it. Some of you like maybe grew up in Chilliwack, so you're thinking about home. Some of you are thinking about how corn kind of looks like a handless, hairy baby arm covered in yellow beads. And you're thinking about maybe making a bunch of yellow bead bracelets and wearing them and doing some sort of a public art piece about capitalism where you look like a corn stalk. <laughs> that person is high in openness, right? There's no walls between one concept and other concepts. They all kind of flow together. They see the connections through all things. Conscientiousness. Conscientiousness is our ability to control our impulses and our tendency towards dutiful achievement. People who score high in conscientiousness are hardworking, efficient, they're rule-bound, they've got like a stick to itness. they're neat, and they'll sacrifice the present for the future. Uh, on the flip side, they're much more prone to shame and guilt and disgust, especially at self, and they tend to be more judgmental. They think other people's problems are their own fault. Conscientiousness is one of the ones that's related the most to an actual physical structure in our brain. It's the frontal lobe. So if you've ever had a family member who's had a head injury like I have, you'll notice that if they've damaged their frontal lobe, their impulse control and decision-making starts to go, even if they were super high in conscientiousness beforehand. They've studied this and they've seen the effects of it. People become much more prone to just like throw themselves at anything that's immediate in their environment. So that's conscientiousness. Extroversion. Extroversion is our sensitivity to positive emotion. Yeah, Pippin, he's like really characteristic. Stealing the fireworks, knocking the bucket over, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, it's different than extroversion how you've probably thought of it. You're probably familiar with the Myers-Briggs idea of extroversion, where it's like if you're extroverted, you get energized by people, and if you're introverted, you get energized by being alone. This is a little bit different. Extroversion in this scale is a little bit more your actual tendency to seek rewards in your environment and to be enthusiastic about it, to feel the positive emotions that come with seeking those rewards. So extroverted people are enthusiastic, talkative, they get caught up in the moment, they can be persuasive and assertive, um, but they are more likely to sacrifice the future for the present. They're impulsive, and particularly if they're low in conscientiousness, they're the most prone to addiction. Uh, extroversion seems to be related to the way our brain produces and processes dopamine. You've probably heard of this neurotransmitter before. It's the thing that's associated with seeking rewards and achieving them. People who are highly extroverted produce more of it and are more sensitive to it. Agreeableness. Agreeableness is our tendency to modify our behavior based on our perception of the mental states of others. So this is like... People like this are empathetic, they're compassionate, they're warm, they're friendly, they probably have a, an idea of how you're feeling or what you're thinking, they tend to be anti-competition, um, but they also are generally poor at negotiating for themselves, they're self-forgetful, they can be overly dependent on people, and they can be overly submissive. Agreeableness seems to relate to our theory of mind. That's the ability to be able to guess what other people are thinking or what they're feeling. Now, it's important to know it's not just that ability, it's caring about what other people are thinking and feeling. Because psychopaths are actually very good at reading people's minds. They just don't care. <laughs> they just use the people, right? And then finally, neuroticism. Neuroticism is our sensitivity to negative emotion. I think Batman's a pretty good example of this. You got to admit, Caleb. It's true, it's true. Um, people who score high in neuroticism, they're sensitive. They're realistic, they're risk adverse, and they experience like the full spectrum of human emotion. Um, but they're also more prone to fear, sadness, irritability, and they tend to have a negative view of both the past and themselves. Um, neuroticism seems to be the sensitivity of kind of the threat response mechanisms in our brain, our amygdala, which is important to know. So people who are more high in neuroticism, they actually see more threats than other people do. Like, their brains are more sensitive to perceiving threats in the environment. So if you're low in neuroticism and you know somebody who's higher in it and you keep being like, what's the deal? It's like, no, they're actually experiencing, like, a threat in a way that you are not. So now that that's out of the way, the thing you've all been waiting for, I can tell you about the ideal Christian, the personality type for the ideal Christian. Okay, here we go. So the ideal Christian is not very high in openness to experience because the truth doesn't change, right? You don't need to be that open, except to be taught by your approved pastors, right? But art and culture and music, especially the art, culture, and music of the world, who needs it? You got the Bible. Conscientiousness. You got to be super conscientious if you want to be a Christian. You got to have that white picket fence, and it's got to be gleaming. Your grass is always mowed. You're saving up for retirement and for your kids' schooling. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Use your brain. It rhymes. It's true. Extroversion. You got to be pretty extroverted to be Christian. We got big rooms full of lots of people who are very happy to see you and lots of loud music. How do we know you love Jesus if you don't show it? Agreeableness. Jesus was a nice guy. You should be a nice person. Enough said. Neuroticism. You got the joy and peace of the Lord in your heart. There's nothing to be scared of, except for maybe, you know, that blood moon and the rapture and all that kind of stuff. If this is your score, congratulations, you are the ideal Christian. <laughs> I hope you know, and it seems like you do, that that's a farce and leads me to a real note on the perfect personality type. There isn't one. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. But seriously, on all ends of the spectrum, in all of these characteristics, there are strengths. These are the unique things you've been gifted with, and there are places where they are a real gift in your life. You may see things that other people don't see, experience things that other people don't experience. And right, when it comes to stewarding ourselves, 
Our personality is probably where we get into what's called our parasympathetic nervous system. That's that rest and heal and digest place where you can just kind of flow because you're operating in your default mode. It literally takes less energy for your brain to do, which means that if you want to be a good steward of yourself, you're going to have to learn how to work with your personality sometimes. Because if you don't, if you put yourself in places where you're only ever working against it, it's a recipe for burnout. But the other flip side of this is, is as a millennial, kind of the thing we're told is that we should all be able to find that place where 100% of the time we're just doing what we're made to do. Like we should all be floating on yachts in the Mediterranean, making TikTok videos for cheese enthusiasts and getting rich doing it. It's not true. You can't do that. You can't be in your zone 100% of the time. My father-in-law worked in business all his life, and early in my career, he gave me some advice that he calls just the 70-30 rule or the 60-40 rule. What, he, what he's learned over his years working with people and hiring people and seeing whether or not they survive in the job and all the leadership advice he's got is that if you can be in a place where 60 to 70% of the time you're doing something that isn't directly contradicting your kind of default mode, you're probably in a sustainable place, right? If 60 to 70% of the time you can be operating in what feels natural to you, you're probably going to be able to sustain that. But no matter what, no matter if you're like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or whoever, 30 to 40% of the time it's going to suck. That's just the way it goes. 30 to 40% of the time you're going to have to do things that go against what your natural tendencies are. And it's that 30 to 40% that we need to talk about now because sometimes we need to work against our personality. When I started out in ministry, I started working through my aggression by lifting heavy weights because throwing weights around is socially acceptable and throwing people around is not. <laughs> Society's weird that way. And early on, I tried a squat that was pretty heavy. And as I went down, I felt... <clears throat> and my, a disc in my back slipped, which is not a good thing. And I went to a physio, though, and I hadn't really done enough study about working out and stuff, and I expected her to kind of chastise me, saying, you weren't strong enough to do this lift. And especially my legs, squats, they're a leg exercise, right? And she said, no, no, your legs are actually too strong. So you're not your legs that were the problem. Your core wasn't strong enough for your legs. And what, this kind of changed my perspective on how we think about strengths and weaknesses. This and another personality assessment that uses this language. What we often consider our weaknesses, you'll find if you spend enough time thinking about it, they're actually just overdone strengths. So say you're really high in agreeableness. You're somebody who is probably warm and empathetic and friendly. People probably come to you seeking counsel and advice and comfort. That's a strength. But say your boss at work is doing something dubious, right? They're, they're cooking the books or something. And for weeks, you're just letting it go by because the discomfort of having that conversation seems to be too great for you. That's not necessarily a weakness. It's your agreeableness getting in the way of you doing something that you know is right. It's an overdone strength. So what we need to learn to do as Christians, is be able to every once in a while work against those natural tendencies that we have. As one wise person said, as Christians, we don't learn about personality just to be like, here I am, accept me the way I am, let me just act out this script. We learn about our personality so our personality doesn't get in the way of us doing what God is calling us to do. And Brian Little, who's a psychological researcher, says this, um, he, he calls these free traits, a free trait is when we enact a script to advance a core project in our life. So that father, who is super disagreeable and not very empathetic, is able to comfort his child when he gets home. So that super introverted, like, artistic, scholarly type is able to get up and be a wonderful presenter as a professor in the classroom, be very extroverted. They're able to go outside the normal realm of their default mode of operation to do what they know they're called to do. Now, the thing that you need to know if you're going to do this kind of thing, though, is that when you're stepping outside, it costs you. A little bit like that greeting time we just had at church, right? So some of you are introverted. If you're introverted, you probably needed to prepare yourself for a few hours before you came to church. 
And then for about 30 seconds, you turned and you greeted your neighbor. And then you're going to go home and you're going to take a three-hour nap to recover from it. But honestly, that's kind of the way it is. If you're going to have to step outside of that natural tendency in a big way, you'll probably have to prepare and you'll probably have to recover. And knowing your personality, having some understanding of your core tendencies is going to help you do that, which will help you steward yourself better and help you be more who God wants you to be in the world. So with all that, we can actually turn back now to Romans 12 because there's one more aspect to this that we just need to close with. In Romans 12, 4 and following, we read, Just for as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesy, oh, it, we'll leave it there. You have different gifts. So, one of the beautiful things, and those who are serving communion can come up now, and as well the worship team. One of the beautiful things about being a Christian is that when you learn about your personality, you learn about that place where you overdo your strengths, you are not alone. You can turn to a brother, you can turn to a sister, and you can say, hey, I'm not very good at this, and you are. Could you help me? Could you, could you coach me through that difficult conversation. I think I've got a blind spot here. Can you help me see something? See, we're not learning about who we are or where we are called just for ourselves. Yes, where our deep passion and the world's deep need meet, that is our calling. It will lead to a fuller, more vibrant life, but ultimately, you are here learning about you for others. I am here learning about me for others. And how fitting that this morning we're coming to the table. The table is the place where we come and we take the body and the blood of Christ inside of us to remind us that we are now his body on earth, that we are his hands and feet both to the world and to each other.